Hi guys, Kiba here from Crypto Slate. Today with me, I've got some guys from Nansen. Do you guys want to introduce yourself? Okay, so um, I'm Elizabeth. I'm a senior research analyst at Nansen. I'm working in the attribution team. So the attribution team is in charge of the labels that you see at Nansen. So for example, if you see like Elite Dex Trader, or you can see who this wallet belongs to who, that's usually under the attribution team's job. So yeah, that is what I do at Nansen. Cool. And Isaac? Yeah, uh, I'm Isaac. I'm chief of staff at Nansen. I work on organizational issues, fundraising, M and A, uh, all that kind of stuff. Cool. Hi, I'm Daniel. I'm a research analyst with Nansen, and I'm working in the Nansen Alpha team. So Nansen Alpha is the highest paid um, tier of Nansen subscription. So besides the on-chain tool, you also get exposure to community uh, research uh, reports and also certain AMAs and private deals as well. Fantastic. So um, that leads on to sort of my, my first question in that I know Nansen's kind of been integral in kind of trying to unwind the mess that's been going on in crypto at the moment, trying to understand who owns what wallet, things like 3AC and the such. Um, so how does the, the tagging, so the attribution, how, how does it work and how do we know that it's accurate? Yeah, so uh, to tackle this question generally about like how, how do we ensure that um, labels are accurate, mm -hmm. so we have sort of two uh, sections in the attribution team. There's a manual component of it, which is, uh, for example, for more high-profile wallets uh, with high balances, like maybe something like Binance, uh, we have manual a team of manual people who will just look into mm -hmm. investigating the address and uh, trying to ensure that it's of the highest accuracy. And if we are even a little bit unsure, we typically we are more conservative because mm -hmm. we do not want to be wrong on, on that front. And then there's also the more automatic part of the labels, which is what um, I do. So we develop sort of algorithms and heuristics to identify patterns, and then we design labels um, based on like programmatic approach. So mm -hmm. we design the code for the labels, and then we just let it run, and then it propagates throughout the network, and then we can blanket labels. and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certain addresses. Because wasn't there, there was, there was a label recently, was it Celsius or 3AC, that was reported on Twitter and ended up being not the right tag? Um, which was that? Do you want to take yeah, so I think that was more of, uh, it wasn't that we tagged it as the wallet, but it was actually um, a refresh, kind of a refresh issue. So it, we didn't tag the wallet as Celsius, but you know, um, when you didn't refresh the page properly, then you can see double labels and stuff like that. Right, okay, yeah. so it was just a UI technical thing. Okay, cool. So, I mean, how, how, be how can people get the most out of Nansen? Um, obviously, there's lots of different teams. You talk about the sort of alpha. Um, what would be the best way to get the most out of it? It's a very <laughs> wide question, I understand, but. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess maybe in um, recent events, in terms of you know protecting yourself, doing some due diligence, I think um, wherever you're you know farming in a pool, for example, you want to identify all the stakeholders in the pool, who's mm -hmm. in the pool, who's uh, holding how many percentage of the liquidity, and that is how you know you can identify these different players, and you know especially if there are funds involved, you know we tag the wallet, there's smart money involved, and you want to you know put smart alerts on all these. Um, transactions that are happening within this pool. So for mm -hmm. example, if in pool A, there's a fund that pulled out their money, you'll be mm -hmm. first to know, and that's how you can make you know, certain investment decisions to protect yourself as well. Did you see any of that ahead of, say, um, the liquidity issues we've had recently? Are there any sort of moments where people that were using Nansen were able to get ahead with certain pools? Yeah, so actually we kind of did a report on the stake if um, yes, I wrote an article on that. Yeah. It was really, really in-depth, really good report, yeah. Yeah, so we work on that report, and I think, um, you know, on, although it's in hindsight, but if you're using Nansen diligently, and you were looking at, you know, you have positions in the pool, you will be, be able to see, you know, big funds uh, and even um, centralized players actually pulling liquidity and, you know, um, selling off as well. Mm -hmm. And this all happened um, on chain, which can be tracked. And, you know, if you have positions in it, you can actually see that, you know, how much they actually pulled out and how mm -hmm. deep the impact was on the pool. And this all happened in um, real time. And if you were in, uh, in the, sp and if you wanted to redraw uh, as fast as you could, you could actually be the ones that, uh, be the first few to do that as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think you actually identified the the bonded Ethereum on Terra was actually one of the biggest causes of the issues that I hadn't really seen in other places until I read the report. I think that was really interesting. Um, do, do you, do you, is that still the belief that the, the, the bonded Ethereum on Terra was a large factor? 
Yeah, so I think you know um, all these things happen in sort of like a contagion. Mm. So I think not only the bonded uh, Ethereum that you know was pulled from um, the Terra ecosystem back to Ethereum and swapped back to Stake ETH before um, changing back to Ethereum, and but also the collapse of you know Luna and UST, where it actually impacted a lot of these players who also own Stake ETH or. Mm -hmm. um, bonded Ethereum. So I think this contagion in fact, uh, you know, led to many of them, uh, especially having who had leveraged positions, had to unwind, selling in unfavorable conditions. And that, you know, really drained a lot of liquidity from not only the wormhole bridge, but also, you know, the, the curve pool as well. Mm -hmm. And that really, um, basically, we concluded that, you know, the contagion actually stemmed from um, from the Luna UST collapse, because you know m many of the major players that sort of like caused the discount were actually involved in both ecosystems as well. Mm, yeah, definitely. Um, well, let, let's let's move to some, a bit more kind of uh, bullish uh, areas now. In terms of, I wanted to ask, do you see any niches within crypto Web three that have a chance from the the data that you guys are looking at daily have a chance to decouple from Bitcoin? Do you think that's a potential future? Mm, I guess. Maybe one just simple thing that I've been looking at is that uh, most most recently, you know, you can see that um, smart money has been accumulating a lot of Ethereum, and they are actually accumulating more Ethereum than uh, Bitcoin as well, and that's why we saw the price shot up. Uh, even though, uh, Ethereum started even leading the charge uh, mm -hmm. recently, so I think that's one thing that uh, was different from just the normal BTC leading the charge as well. Mm -hmm. About yourselves, anyone else? Not really for me. Yeah, I think Daniel covered it. Um, but looking forward, uh, we have seen in the past like NFTs tend to be counter cyclical, or rather, they last a bit longer in the mm -hmm. run. Um, and I think, like you know, similarly, you could also see that pick up in the next cycle. Mm -hmm. And I think it's obviously do you reckon that is that partly due to kind of NFTs are a little bit more liquid than sort of just selling on an exchange. People have bought an NFT even if they want to sell quickly. The sort of the the bid ask spread on NFTs is a lot wider, isn't it? I think illiquidity is definitely an issue. I think the other one is also like the si the type of trader seeking returns. So you know, like uh, I would guess that NFT traders denominate in ETH primarily, right? I mean, sure, like other layer ones as well. But like then they want to outperform ETH, then that pushes them to seek uh, more trades, take on mm -hmm. more risk. So th there's like you know different flavors to the way they trade. So. Talking about sort of trends, two of the things that I'm hearing the most here at ECC are around cross-chain interoperability and UX, and the need to push both of those uh, forward uh, for the sort of the next bull run. Is is that something that, that you guys have sort of visibility on? Something that you think's also a trend? Yeah. So um. Yeah, I think for us at Nansen, we are definitely trying to be um, to cover as much chains as possible mm -hmm. and cover bridges. So we also look at bridges at data, mm -hmm. and also um, we are working on labels across all the different chains. So um, in terms of, I guess, because we are a data analytics platform, so we we are just looking at the data that we have. We um, yeah, we aim to cover as many chains as we can, and yeah, I guess. So, but how how do you do the attribution then? How do you know? How do you create the certainty, or even just the inkling that a certain wallet belongs to someone else? Is it off-chain stuff, or um, we are actually largely on-chain, so really purely just on-chain. Um, so manual labels definitely uh, we investigate them manually if there's um, anything that seems off or, or interesting. Um, but the automatic labels we are also very careful with them. So usually how it works is. Uh, user requests a feature or internally there's demand for a certain kind of label, uh, we will try to um, research on it first and then develop the code for it. And then when we have developed something, we also test it afterwards so to ensure that it is accurate. So if anything looks um, off, we will still we will go back into the research phase and then continue improving before we release anything. So is that sort of like if you think that certain wallet is Binance, then depositing mm -hmm. into the, the wallet and seeing if the money comes through? Yes, yes, exactly. So centralized exchanges are. Mm -hmm. We have a sub team that is dedicated to centralized exchanges as well. Yeah, I yeah. think I saw that in the report. You did some sort of testing within the report, didn't you, to, to finalize that? Um, what about yourself? Do, do, you, do you think 
in terms of UX um, and cross-chain um, interoperability, is that the future? Are we looking towards multi a multi-chain future? Or are you saying that there's a lot of smart we're going into Ethereum? Do you think that we could see a, a th Ethereum taking over completely? I think, you know, in terms um, of yeah, Ethereum has actually matured a lot and, you know, have certainly have a lot of progress, but definitely, you know, there's a market like we've seen with so many other L1s, L2s as well. So I think, yeah, you know, being, um, having multiple chains, I think there's um, to, to bring everyone on board as well. So that will be very good. Like we see that um, actually Terra brought a huge amount of retail to crypto as well, mm -hmm. but, you know, uh, that didn't turn out so well. <laughs> but in the end, um, you know, I think there will be other players that emerge to cover different aspects. Like we see um, covering, you know, retail, you know, some chains focusing on gaming, NFTs and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. maybe each chain might have their own niche, but you know, Ethereum is definitely something that, you know, everyone still fall back on as well. So I know that, so you, you cover NFTs now, don't you? You have a whole a platform with that. Is there any other niche that you think may require it, its own area? Like say like gaming and metaverse, do you think that's going to need its own sort of Extra yeah. add on. So I guess um, for gaming, we do cover like specific to you know protocols or projects. We do cover um, X Infinity, mm -hmm. and we do show like statistics on the flows, the number of users, and stuff like that. So I think um, for greater visibility, especially for games that have very high impact like X, mm -hmm. I think it might be important to you know share the data to you know people who might be having you know guilds or having um, mm -hmm. involvement in the project which makes it much more transparent for them so i think that's one direction that we you know might actually do towards as well so it could be sort of like guild tracking and seeing how the, the guilds are doing across. guild tracking dao tracking or even uh, specific to certain games and the mm -hmm. economy and um, whether there's any data that they should look at before you know getting involved as well because i think it's really important because i think there's only really like valve and steam that give any sort of analytics around sort of like gamer player base and stuff and i think that level of transparency for me like, as a gamer is actually really important you like you want to know how many people are actually playing this game is it declining is it like if i had to invest into the game i want to see that the player base is growing not declining whereas like console games you you just got to trust their word that there's a certain number of players so you're saying that one of the extra features we'll have with web3 gaming is be able to track a whole load of extra data with it being on chain yeah, definitely. I think this transparency, especially when it comes to large amount of money, because you know, compared to normal games, there's not a large amount of money by an individual mm -hmm. that's invested. So, and I think yeah, that's, that will be the way going forward as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Brilliant. So you guys, I think, perfectly positioned. Obviously, no, this isn't going to be financial advice, but using your tools, what would you suggest are things to be thinking about that might give people an insight into what will be the turning point for the market to go back towards a bull market? Yeah, I guess definitely there's no certainty of when the turning no. point is, but I think, you know, looking at long-term players in the space accumulating, I think mm -hmm. that gives very good sort of like uh, maybe an entry position, for example, where they think that the risk reward is fantastic and that you know, these players, um, of course, you have to identify which players you want to follow and which mm -hmm. players you think are, are forward looking and long term looking. And that's the players that I would personally follow as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wait, these house. Um, I would say look at smart money. So see what smart money is doing, um, whether they are buying or selling, what are they buying, what are they selling? And um, also particularly for NFTs, we have NFT in this indices so like we have subcategories as well like for art for gaming for mm. metaverse profile pics we have um categorized the different type of entities and it's like an index you can see the trend whether it's going up or going down so mm -hmm. that could be like a good place to start for an overview of like the nft market how is it doing that's really really smart so if that means if there's one project that's doing well you could maybe well notify that okay well this is a general trend that's going down though this mm -hmm. is like an outlier and decide mm -hmm. whether you think it's because they're early or is it just a pump based yeah. on some good marketing yeah exactly and also like we have overview um there's also like the nft paradise there's like a 24-hour market overview i think that's also a good place to look at i remember when nft was super hype like it was all green because we have floor prices as well mm -hmm. like three day change seven day change and like it was all green everything was up mm -hmm. so that's like a good indicator of like, oh, we are we are pretty bullish now. Of course, now it doesn't look like that, but mm -hmm. um, that's also a good place to look at if you want to see trends, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yourself? So I, I recall back in 2021, when we saw the NFT 
you know, craze pick up. You had like mini bull cycles and then the volume dropped off and then a much bigger bull cycle and the volume dropped off and then finally, you know, with the whole craze back sometime in like July, uh, I would look out for bumps in volume. So like these kind of uh, earlier cycles indicate like, you know, the, the smarter money accumulating first and then trading among themselves and then that kind of, uh, you know, spreads out in, through osmosis of information to mm -hmm. the, the other market participants. So with that being said, uh, we end up with another bull market coming. What does the, the timeline and the route to mass adoption in crypto look like to you? And again, I'm not going to say, okay, I want to know the date at which we're going to have mass adoption. But say, what's that route look like? What are the things that you think are going to start to happen in, in a certain order? Yeah, that, that's tough. Because mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, like, uh, it's something that a lot of chains are trying to solve trying to onboard the next billion people. Mm -hmm. If one thing we've learned from these cycles, I think it's that there's a need to focus on actual products that solve real problems. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm like confident that like with each cycle, the space matures, the tech mm -hmm. becomes uh, you know, more concrete. Uh, there are people who actually want to use the product. And so I think you know, as, as that trend continues, we'll mm -hmm. see like the cycles um, also mature and like we'll have actual users of products. Mm -hmm. Cool. Anyone else? Yeah, maybe about you know maybe certain regulations coming into play, you know, protecting investors and stuff like that. So I think um, the market has definitely identified the need for a bit of regulation as well, and and we actually can see regulation as a bullish um, indicator where it makes people more. Uh, maybe even a mass uh, adoption more comfortable actually putting their money in crypto and I think this would be the way going forward as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what's next for Nansen? What are the, what are the tools that we think, what, what's coming out, anything new in the, on the horizon? Yeah, well, for that, you just have to get Nansen. But um, I mean, we, we, have a, you know, we have a pretty good position in the market now. Uh, and I, I think that positions us well to consolidate in the next few years. Um, and you know, because we're chain agnostic, protocol agnostic, um, we go to where the demand for data is. Mm -hmm. um, that means that you know, we are able to catch the trends much earlier. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Right, well, thank you very much, guys. Thanks for taking the, the time to speak to us. And uh, look forward to, to seeing what's next and reading the next reports.